Hi, welcome back to General Chemistry 2. My name is Chuck White, and today we're going to talk about transition metal complexes. First, we're going to talk about transition metals, which are metals where we're filling up the D-level shells uh, in the periodic table. And we'll talk about how me these metals can form chemical bonds to ligands using Lewis acid-base interactions. We'll talk about nomenclature and how to name the complexes. We'll talk a little bit about how structural isomers and stereoisomers can arise from the different arrangements of ligands around a metal. So transition metals are elements with partially filled D shells, and because it takes 10 electrons to fill in each D shell, we have a wide range of physical properties like ionization energy, electronegativity, atomic size, melting point, enthalpy of hydration, reduction potential, everything. We can have formal oxidation states of metals in complexes from zero, which is a little bit uh, uncommon, to plus two, which is very common, plus three, which is common, all the way up to plus seven for manganese, uh, which is a, a little bit less common. Um, all the metals are Lewis acids, that is to say they are electron acceptors to fill in the remainder of the D shell, and they can form multiple metal ligand bonds. So. Um, Let's talk about transition metal complexes. These complexes are formed by Lewis acid base bonds between the electron poor metals and the electron rich ligands. The electron poor metals are electron acceptors or Lewis acids. The ligands are electron rich and are the electron donors or Lewis bases. And unlike uh, covalent bonds or ionic bonds, both of the electrons in these bonds are contributed by the ligand. So it's really a donor acceptor thing, not uh, thing where each bond, each uh, partner brings one electron to the table like in a covalent bond or where one uh, electronegative atom steals uh, an electron from uh, the electropositive thing. Uh, this is really a donor acceptor interaction. Many electron, uh, many transition metal complexes have bright colors due to low-lying electronic states, and so we'll talk a little bit about electronic structure. And they can have coordination numbers or numbers of metal ligand bonds ranging from two, for example, in the silver diamine complex, uh, to six, which is a fairly common arrangement of uh, ligands around a central metal ion, as shown for this hexamine cobalt three complex. So naming coordination compounds requires about six different rules. The first thing to do is to identify the ligands, uh, neutral ligands like amine and aqua for uh, ammonia and water, uh, negatively charged uh, ligands like chloro and cyano, and uh, chelating ligands like ethylene diamine. And you place them in alphabetical order. And then assign prefixes for the number of each type of ligand, so diamine, triaqua, tetrachloro, that sort of thing. If you have polydate, uh, polydentate ligands or chelating ligands like ethylene diamine, instead of using di and tri, you use uh, bis, tris, tetricus uh, prefixes. Finally, you uh, name the metal and put the oxidation state as a Roman, Roman numeral in parentheses. And there's a special rule that if the complex uh, itself is anionic, then you use the suffix "-ate", like ferrate or cobaltate, uh, to indicate that um, the complex is negatively charged. You write the name of the complex and uh, by listing the ligands first, followed by the metal. Uh, but just to make things more complicated, when writing the formula of the complex, you write the metal first, followed by the ligands. And then you name the entire uh, compound by writing it as two words. The cation goes first and the anion goes last. And it doesn't matter whether the complex is cation cationic or anionic. Uh, you always put the cation first. So let's take a look at a couple of examples. Um, this compound is called pentaaqua chlorochromium 3 chloride. Notice that uh, in this case the complex is positively charged and so you require chloride counterions and you write pentaaqua because there are five water molecules as ligands and chloro because there's only one um, chlorine atom or chloride ion as a ligand, uh, then you use chromium-3 to indicate the oxidation of state of the chromium and uh, just chloride as the counter ion. It turns out that because you have chromium-3 and one chloride uh, ligand, uh, the overall charge of the complex is plus two and so you need uh, two counter ions. So the um, 
oxidation state of the metal is key to figuring out how many counterions you need. Uh, the opposite case where you have an anionic complex is potassium hexacyanoferrate 3, where the uh, iron ion is in the plus 3 oxidation state. You have six uh, negatively charged cyano ligands, and uh, so the overall charge on the complex is minus 3, and so you need three potassium ions as positive counter ions, uh, which are written first. Uh, iron. Uh, when bound to five carbonyl ligands is called pentacarbonyl iron, uh, and uh, you write a zero to indicate that the overall uh, charge is, ne is uh, neutral, and the iron must be in the zero oxidation state because each CO ligand is neutral as well. Uh, the next compound is called pentaamine carbonato cobalt-3 bromide, and so this is a case where the uh, overall complex has a plus one positive charge, and so you need one bromide ion as a counter ion. You have five um, ammonia ligands, so it's pentaamine, and uh, CO3 has an overall charge of negative two, so that's carbonato. And so you have um, the cobalt plus three and the carbonato minus two equals an overall plus one charge for the complex, and therefore one bromide ion. For the last complex, you have tris-ethylenediamine platinum-4 bromide, and uh, that means that the platinum must be in the plus-4 oxidation state, so you need four bromide ions as counterions. The ethylenediamine ligands are uh, bidentate, so each one binds to two different sites in the platinum uh, on, on the platinum metal, uh, but you have three of them. And because they're polydentate ligands, uh, you use the word tris to indicate the three ligands for the six binding sites. Now, these are the most common three-dimensional structures for um, metal complexes. For ligand, uh, for two ligands, the most common structure is linear. It's unusual to see bent uh, uh, structures for transition metal complexes. Uh, for four ligands, you can either have a tetral of tetrahedral arrangement of ligands around the central metal ion, or you can have a square planar arrangement. The latter is more common for D8 metal ions like uh, platinum-2 and gold-3. Uh, for five ligands, the most common arrangement is a trigonal bipyramidal arrangement, where you have three equatorial ligands and then uh, two axial ligands in slightly different um, uh, binding sites. Uh, and for six ligands, you have an octahedral arrangement. This is the most common arrangement of ligands around a central metal ion. And uh, here, all, uh, all six of the ligands have identical metal ligand bonds to the central metal, uh, metal ion. We can form various uh, structural isomers, which have the same molecular formula, but different connectivities between the atoms. There are basically two ways of doing this. One is a coordination isomer, where a ligand exchanges with a counter ion, so a uh, uh, cobalt chloride can become a cobalt bromide, where the chloride is now the counter ion, or a linkage isomer, where the metal can bind to a different site on the ligand. There are several different types of ligands uh, that can bind uh, one of two ways. Uh, this one, uh, if you bind the metal to the nitrogen end of this ligand, it's called thiocyanato. If you bind the metal to the sulfur end of the ligand, it's called isothiocyanato. So uh, those two are just uh, the same things but with the ligand flipped head to tails. Stereoisomers have the same atom connectivity and the same, same formula, but different spatial arrangements of atoms. So, for example, in the square, uh, square planar complex um, uh, platinum uh, diamine dichloro, you can have a trans arrangement where the like ligands are on the opposite sides of the metal, or you can have a cis arrangement where the like ligands are adjacent to each other. And so uh, these trans and cis isomers can exist in octahedral arrangements as well, where trans basically means opposite and cis means adjacent. 
optical isomers are non-superimposable mirror images of each other, and you can think of this as left and right-handed uh, types of complexes. Your left and right hand are functionally similar and the connectivities are the same. Uh, all of the physical properties of optical isomers are the same, except that uh, they are mirror images that can't be superimposed on each other, just like your left and right hand cannot be. And so um, they are uh, optical isomers, and they have the property that a pure opti optical isomer will rotate the plane of polarized light. Next time we'll talk about the electronic structure of transition metal complexes, the, the simple crystal field theory, and the more complicated ligand field theory. We'll see you then.